growing up on the west side of Chicago, I do want to say that I really love my city. And I mean, other than the fact that I will never get adjusted to the weather here, uh, <laughs> I mean, I, I think it's pretty amazing. Um, also, I know that growing up uh, in Chicago, there has been a lot of uh, negativity in the news about gun violence. So I'm just really thankful to be able to stand here and represent my city in a positive way. Um, I know that this city is an amazing place to be, but it's not all good in, in communities like mine and others like it as well. Um, as you all may know, there is a major issue with gun violence in a lot of low-income communities in Chicago. And with these senseless shootings, it's resulting to a lot of innocent people being killed as well as our youth being killed. Uh, but the sad part about the fact is, is that these perpetrators are just kids themselves as well. Um, it's really to the point where the saying, to be aware is to be alive, really does apply to everyday life when growing up in these communities. Um, for example, let me tell you a story about three young men at a barbershop. Um, you had one by the name of Marcus who owned the barbershop, uh, and then there was another named Eddie who was the cousin of Marcus, and then you had Jason who was the friend of both. Um, and one summer night, as they were getting ready to call it a night and head home, they had two strange visitors enter the shop. Um, one of the guys had a limp in his walk as if he was carrying something on his waist, and the other was asking if, if they had changed for 100. Now, the, the fact that it was so late and people were walking around looking for a change for 100, it kind of made things feel a little suspicious. So Marcus and Jason decided that they were going to go next door to a restaurant to see if they had that change that they were looking for. Um, of course, they were aware that something wasn't right. So as they went next door to get changed, they noticed that Eddie never came out. Um, so thinking quickly, Jason decides to go back next door to check on Eddie, only to find out that the robbers had a gun pointed to the back of Eddie's head. Uh, at the time, he wasn't aware of what was going on because he was half asleep in the barbershop. So Jason decides to kick the door in order to distract the robbers and try to run off. Um, and let's just say that the distraction worked, but the attempt to run off wasn't so successful, as the robbers now had the gun pointed to the back of Jason's head, telling him, don't move or they'll shoot. Um, at the moment, Jason said that at, while the robber was going to his pockets, all he could think about was the people's reaction around him. Um, he was hoping that no one triggered this perpetrator to shoot. He said that he noticed that the people in the restaurant was watching from the window um, nervously. Um, there were people across the street watching curiously. And then there was a young lady running inside the restaurant with her son um, as they were running to safety. Um, during this time, Jason notices that his friend Eddie is now sneaking across the street to safety. Um, one of the robbers decided to let Eddie go, and they were advising the robber who now had Jason to do the same so that they could get away before the police come. But before the robber decides to let Jason go, he had to threaten Jason's life a, a couple times. So he just kept yelling to him, you know, I should shoot you. You know, what else do you have? Um, but eventually he does decide to let Jason go as they ran away before the police come. But you can see how an ordinary day at the, rest, at the barbershop can turn into a life-threatening situation. Um, here it is that you had someone who was just trying to get a haircut and just hang out, and now you had two robbers threatening their lives. At this time, and at this rate, what if that shooter had not thought and instead shot this, this, this innocent victim? Um, in far too many situations, that is the case where they're not thinking and they're just shooting. And it's resulting to a lot of innocent victims um, being, having their lives taken away before they can be that, that future leader, that doctor, or that writer, or that inspiring person who's looking to ultimately create change, not only uh, in their community, but around the world. And with that being said, I would like to introduce myself personally. Um, my name is Anthony Jason Sturdivant, and I am that innocent victim from that 2009 robbery which could have taken my life. Yet today, I stand in front of you as an award-winning screenwriter, producer, community activist, leader, and the president and founder of Think Before You Shoot. So, so it's not a lot of people who get an opportunity to walk away from that type of situation and grow into who they want to be. So what I decided was 
I had to figure out a way to help change what was going on in our communities. Um, so what I did was I actually went and I started an uh, organization called Think Before You Shoot with my first film that I released in 2011. At the time, I was educating myself um, into how to be a screenwriter and independent filmmaker. Um, Think Before You Shoot is an organization that utilizes short films and student outreach programs in order to stress the importance of thinking before participating in the act of gun violence. And what I wanted to do with these short films was I wanted to create a certain level of success that would help develop more students. And then I also wanted to, to provide the world with something that will be entertaining, yet deliver positive messages. So think before you shoot, the film actually started off as an improv idea. Um, I was demonstrating to someone how creative I could be as a writer. Um, I was telling them how, how, how cool it would be to create a series of films that will not only deliver positive messages, but that will entertain people enough to make them want to also share this message. Um, I thought about how I could add three certain concepts to these films that will also educate people. Um, one of these concepts was a freeze frame. So basically what I wanted to do was pause the film during the climax of a shooting incident. And this is usually when the gun is drawn and fired and when it's usually too late to think about it. Another concept that I wanted to add was I wanted to show the reaction of, everyone's, of everyone in the facility of a shooting incident. And this was my way of showing possible perpetrators that you are not just harming a victim, but you're harming those around as well. And the third concept that I wanted to make sure I add was the rewind aspect of the film. And this was my way of showing possible perpetrators that you can control your own actions and how to think about your actions and possibly handle them differently. So after releasing my first short film and gaining a little bit of exposure, I had realized that this was me actually writing about my own experience from the barbershop. Remember, um, during the time of the incident and the robber having a gun pointed to the back of my head, all I could think about was the people's reaction around me. And I just didn't want them to trigger this perpetrator to shoot. You know, any flinch, any scream, anything could have actually scared this perpetrator. So all I wanted to do was concentrate on those that was around me. And what happened was I released the film, I gained a little exposure, and then I realized that this was my purpose and that I started to think a little differently. And that is actually how I'm standing here before you today in order to share my experience. So after releasing the film, um, I decided that I should move on with the organization. I started with another film, Think Before You Shoot Too. And with this film, I had gained uh, more exposure than the first one and this is what allowed me to move on to the next step of the organization. But before I go more in depth with the films and with this organization, I would like to show you um, one of my films. Um, and this is Think Before You Shoot Too. <laughs> Go in on you, bruh. Yeah, he did. It hurt a little bit, too. Man, you gotta do something about this. Just let me post right here till you come out. I'm gonna put an end to this.
It's jammed, bro. Just get out of here. After releasing the second film, um, I had realized and I discovered that this is what I wanted to do. This was my purpose. And with these films, I didn't want to preach down to individuals because I know they, be they can become so defenseless. But instead, what I wanted to do was I wanted to empower and encourage those that could possibly become perpetrators to just think before they shoot. Um, a, lot of these, uh, a lot of these senseless shootings are resulting from retaliation. So even as you can see from the film, um, I wanted to also connect with the viewers uh, visually and emotionally so that they too will want to share these messages and help encourage change. And to break down some of the messages in the film, I like to have an open discussion. And this is what I do with the youth in order to, again, encourage and provide the guidance to them um, while they're defenseless. So in the film, you notice that someone had a black eye um, you notice someone had a bandage wrapped around their hand. So this pretty much showed that there was an altercation even prior to the shooting incident. And so this is how I open up my discussion with the youth about um, retaliation and about how to handle certain situations and how every action doesn't require a reaction. Um, and then also in the film, one of the messages that I show is even after the perpetrator elected not to shoot, he still got back in the car and said that the gun jammed. Um, I make sure I let the kids know that that was a lie. The gun didn't jam. What happened was he thought about his actions and he decided not to shoot. But he lied in order to keep his cool points. He wanted to not seem as if he punked out to his friends. And I make sure I understand that and I talk to the kids and this is how I open up the discussion about peer pressure. You know, and this is all through entertainment. So I talked to him about peer pressure and not feeling like they're less of a person because they don't want to do anything. Or not, or not by letting someone peer pressure you into doing something you don't want to do. I mean, even if it's as simple as not eating a piece of chocolate bar. You know, if you don't want to eat it, don't eat it. You know, and I make sure they understand that. So with these films, my intention is to provide the proper guidance that these kids need why they're defenseless. You know, they could be so guarded due to the fact that they are going through so much. But if we utilize the resources and the tools that already has captured their, their attention to further educate them and further provide them with the confidence to be successful, I think they will be a lot more quicker to engage with you and to be more responsive of what's going on in their world. And as you can see, we pulled off every concept that I explained previously in the film. And so after releasing Think Before You Shoot 2, uh, the media started reaching out, um, awards started coming in, and success started to develop. And that helped me move to the next step of the organization. My goal then was to take these films and the messages and the success to the youth and the schools to show them that you too can come up with something positive and create success from it as well while still uplifting others around you. And what happened was I started doing two-hour seminars. I started going to different schools, showing the film, um, and then having open discussions on the messages. And then I started inspiring them throughout my story to help them gain the same confidence I got in order to create success. And what happened was, even while I was doing these visits, I started getting calls, emails, and requests from teachers, principals, students, and more about coming back to their school, and some wanted me to make a visit. Um, they were saying how much the students loved the films, how much they love the messages and what I represent. And what happened was this allowed me to move further with the organization. After getting so many requests and after making so many visits, I decided to come up with a 12-week after-school program. Now, this 12-week after-school program was a way of me being able to connect with other students visually and creatively to show them how to express themselves. Um, this 12-week program turned out to be a creative writing and media arts program in which I demonstrate to them how to creatively express themselves and visually get their ideas out, like I did myself. Um, we both are going through so much, 
yet I want to provide them with the proper resources to become successful. Um, a lot of these kids have so much anger, so much disappointment built up inside of them that they walk around with this anger and with this violence because they don't know how to express it. So I give them certain activities like graphic novel writing. To us and to the kids, it's something fun. They're coming up with a superhero, a comic book. Yet, this is my way of subliminally letting them know how to release some tension. So what they have to do is come up with a superhero. That superhero has to fight for something that's, even, that's either solving the issue in their personal life or their community. Then they also have to tie their weaknesses and strengths to the superhero. Now, usually when you tell someone to quickly write down something, they write the first thing that comes to their head, and it's usually something dealing with them. So now I have these students, not only are they giving us superhero strengths and weaknesses, but they're now letting me know what their strengths and weaknesses are. And then I also make them come up with a villain. And then I make them come up with a five-line dialogue between a superhero and a villain, and this is their way of letting me know how they will react when they see someone that they have an enemy with. So it's whether they're going to react aggressively, maybe they have questions that they would like to have answered to this villain or to this enemy. So this is my way of subliminally getting them to let off some of the steam that they have built up inside of them. So with this 12-week program, it, it allowed me to help to, to, grow, to help grow more leaders, help give the youth more voices, and to help them cope with so much anger and, and frustration that's built up inside of them. And that purpose evolved, and it allowed me to see that this organization can grow into something much more bigger. Um, also, what I wanted to do was I wanted to provide the, the proper resources to give these students more faith in themselves. Um, a lot of these kids are just resource starved. They don't know how to get out of their situations, and they just don't have the faith that things will get better. And this is all excuses for them to live as reckless as possible and to go out and do things without thinking about their actions. So what we want to do here at Think Before You Shoot, and what I want to do is help restore the value of life back into the youth. I want to help give them a purpose, help them find a way to generate success and believe in themselves. And in order to do that, I have to show them that there are success stories coming out of neighborhoods like mine and theirs. And so what, this, and so what we are doing now is we're helping develop more support in the communities. We want to restore the value back into the youth and we want to help give them that confidence. So imagine if that perpetrator had not elected to think and instead shot me in 2009. I would not be standing here today as the leader that I am, the man that I have become, and the inspiring artist that I am that's looking to help create change, not only in my city, but around the world. So I hope that I have been able to uh, inspire you and anyone else to go out there and help develop more leaders help show people how they can be creative, and help show people how they can build up their communities. Because we definitely need help um, changing what's going on with the gun violence. Um, this is not a one-man show. It's going to take not only the community, but the world to help encourage change. Um, so I do want to thank all of you for coming out. Um, I thank TED Talk for this opportunity, as I can now go back to the youth with yet another amazing accomplishment, and to show them that success and positivity still wins. And, and I just want to ask, you know, just please, you know, let's, let's help these kids. Um, we all need it. And, and again, thank you for coming out.